anyways, I'm Daryl Owens. I'm happy to be here and talk to the task force. Uh, I intend to not only talk about my personal experiences with gentrification and what I've seen from a lot of the data work that I've done um, on the impacts of housing affordability in California, but also propose a couple of solutions I think uh, that the task force should consider. Thank you, we're looking forward to it. The slide should it be up. That's not mine. That's um, Goodman. I'm Daryl Owens. It should be uh, housing issues facing Black Californians. Apologize. No problem. And how long do I have? Like four, 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes? You have 20 minutes. Okay. That's it, great. Um, yeah, so uh, let's go to the first slide, please. Or uh, I guess the second slide. Um, so the census data uh, from the recently conducted census 2020 shows what we already know which is that there is a large exodus of black Californians out of the state. Um, they are obviously being priced out from the housing and affordability. And uh, as we can see here, the big hotspot is Alameda County, which is where Oakland is and uh, Los Angeles County. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is another map that I've compiled uh, using census data showing that the decline of black residents is heavily focused in Oakland um, and uh, actually much of the historic black enclaves in the uh, Bay Area, such as Richmond and uh, San Francisco. And uh, you also see a similar pattern happening in uh, Los Angeles around, you know, Compton and Inglewood. Next slide. Uh, one of the very important things to understand about gentrification is that we tend to talk about it in the recent 10-year uh, uh, economic boom that California has undergone, but it's been a problem for quite a while now, for many decades actually. And if you look at, for example, the decline of black residents um, in the 2000s versus the 2010s for a lot of cities in California, uh, here we see Oakland, LA, San Francisco, uh, the decline of black residents was actually greater in the previous decade um, than it was in the 2010s. And this is clearly motivated by the, also the growing affordability crisis, but primarily the subprime crisis um, in which uh, black folks were foreclosed and displaced in mass. Um, and this is something that needs uh, restorative justice and uh, not restorative, but uh, reparations uh, to combat because it has essentially eliminated a large swath of black wealth um, and caused a mass exodus um, out of the state or to suburban and rural areas um, far away from their jobs. Next slide, please. Um, so we see that a lot of black folks are moving. Um, I actually, I don't know if I can drop in the chat anywhere, if there's a chat, I don't know if that thing exists, um, but uh, in case it doesn't, I, I compiled a map of where black folks are generally moving to. Um, and they're generally moving to southwestern cities like Phoenix and Houston and Dallas, um, uh, King County and Seattle. These are the sort of top destinations for uh, black residents. These are the fastest growing black cities in Atlanta. Um, their homes are just uh, much more affordable. Um, they build a lot more than California does. And uh, this is leading to a exodus uh, to more cheaper places. And I believe that, can you move to the next slide? I think it's on this slide, but maybe it's not. 
Uh, it's not really. Okay. Um, the, the reason why is because what we see, and at least my experience with gentrification, is that a lot of these communities are, you know, renter communities. So I, I grew up in a, an area of a lot of black homeowners and a plethora of black renters. And a lot of people are leaving California because, no, no, you don't have to move to the next one. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, a lot of black folks are leaving because they're trying to build wealth. Uh, and home ownership opportunities are locked out for them in the state of California or in areas uh, where uh, they would live. So this is a huge problem that we need to confront, which is how do we stop the stem of black folks who are seeking home ownership um, from just going off to other areas? Uh, and so these are a, a list of reasons why I think that we need to solve this problem. Gentrification is causing a lot of evictions, uh, which has led to a massive increase in homelessness. Homelessness, of course, got a huge boost um, after the foreclosure crisis, that's when we really started seeing the shanty towns and the large tent cities um, because of the foreclosure crisis. Um, we know that black schools are heavily uh, underfunded because they're dependent on the value of property um, and Prop 13 has uh, done tremendous damage to black schools. Uh, and we have a pretty uh, Jim Crow-like economic system where wealthier suburban commuters come into uh, large black metros and extract wealth but don't pay taxes into the local system, which in turn leads to disinvestment. Uh, we also need to address the largest uh, contributor to uh, 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 black suffering in the last century, which is uh, redlining. And this is something that, you know, we tend to focus a lot on slavery and slavery is very important. Um, but the denial of black people to live in certain neighborhoods, the denial of the GI Bill, uh, the FHA not giving black folks uh, mortgages, essentially prevented black people from building wealth um, like their white peers did. And this in turn has led to a uh, never solved, uh, never ending perpetual uh, wealth disparity uh, between black folks and uh, non-black people. Uh, next slide, please. Next, uh, thank you. Um, so, what are some issues um, in particular that black renters face, right? So, as I discussed earlier, black renters are leaving the state, a lot of them because they're trying to find home ownership and they're trying to build wealth. They don't want to pay their landlord their wages forever. Um, we have an issue with uh, Section 8 users who face endless landlord discrimination. Uh, we have an issue, as the previous uh, speaker noted, uh, prior convictions, particularly felony convictions. Um, it makes housing almost impossible to find nowadays uh, for people dealing with felonies. And uh, subsidized housing in the state of California is oftentimes built in formerly redline areas themselves. Um, and these are part of the problem. Um, and black renters are also severely rent burdened. Uh, so a couple of proposals that I have that the committee I think should look into is uh, passing a prohibition. The state legislature should pass a prohibition on um, income, a source of income. Uh, and background checks uh, to any severe extent. Uh, ultimately, for a landlord, I think the only thing that should concern them is their ability to pay. Uh, using people's past against them, especially in a predatory criminal justice system, is a great way to keep black folks in perpetual homelessness. Um, I think that for a lot of urban areas, we want to look into co-housing um, ideas. Uh, and I would like them to also have, in addition to being co-housing systems, uh, maximum planning flexibility. So the, I mentioned Fillmore in there. There's a really good Fillmore cooperative that is mostly black and they're going to use like market rate units and commercial to like generate lots of revenue and build wealth. Uh, and um, I think that we should also look at lending practices uh, for potential black homeowners to buy housing uh, that frankly, if you have any history or a family that was denied loans, in the previous century, um, and it, it was by the FHA, it was essentially racialized discrimination that was in, uh, completely legal at the time, you should have a much lower standard uh, to acquire a loan than other groups of people. It doesn't have to specify race, but FHA redlining will clearly consistently uh, indicate uh, people of African descent. Next uh, slide, please. Um, so issues facing black homeowners is that, um, and this is a very prominent problem from where I'm from in um, Oakland and Berkeley, is that a lot of black homeowners, as soon as they run into a financial issue, cash out their houses. And uh, because that's the only asset of value they have. So you have a lot of black folks with low incomes and all of a sudden they're sitting on a million dollar house. Um, reverse mortgages are a primary way in which a lot of black folks get displaced in California. And this is a huge problem because this means that they don't have any other sources of income. 
Um, we also have some black folks living in, you know, unsafe conditions because they're subdividing their homes illegally without proper standards. And uh, we have an issue too, which is that a lot of black folks, when they're homeowners and they sell their houses, they don't sell to other black folks. Um, a lot of other communities just don't do that. They try to make sure that land and property stay within their community, but uh, black folks, in order to get the highest amount of money they possibly can, uh, are oftentimes forced to sell to people who are not black. Um, so there's a couple things we need to do here. I think number one, you know, this has come up in Oakland a lot among community groups, and I think this is a really great idea. Uh, recent laws that allow for multifamily housing, uh, that we should not only help and assist black homeowners in building a second unit, but also um, basically finance it from a public sector. Um, this will allow a lot of black homeowners to build wealth uh, without actually having to sell their homes, uh, which is a really great idea I think that we should push on. I think that we need to absolutely fine and penalize assessors who are undervaluing black property. If an assessor is found doing that, um, then they need to be barred or uh, heavily penalized. And um, yeah, that, those are some of the big two things that I think we can do for black homeowners in the state. Next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, this just breaks down some, I think, uh, reparations that would be really good. Uh, I mentioned earlier about, you know, cooperatives and community groups uh, doing their own housing projects. Um, this is very common in Canada among uh, native indigenous nations. Um, Sina um, I don't know how to pronounce the name, but uh, if you Google that name, um, Sinaqu, uh, I, I can't pronounce, Sinaq, I believe. Uh, this is a really big example of um, uh, native nations in Canada building wealth um, through building housing and through providing housing for their own communities. Uh, they do both. It's it's really smart, and it's they have complete control over their land as a reparation. Um, I think also if we want to look at public housing, uh, there is currently a public housing bill in the legislature that uh, I uh, helped contribute to with my group East Bay for Everyone. And there's a lot of good ideas from places like Singapore for for where the government builds public housing, um, but unlike public housing here, where you there's no way to build wealth in it, you you, you just essentially pay rent. Um, in Singapore, you own the public unit under a, a, like a century long lease. This can allow for public subsidies to give black folks a rifle reparation and building up equity um, paid for by the state. Um, and also we could look to just, and this isn't necessarily reparations because we shouldn't separate reparations out from how to solve the housing crisis in general, but there are places like Houston, which has reduced homelessness considerably um, by building a lot of affordable housing um, and doing a lot of hotel and motel conversions um, and also just keeping prices down in general. Um, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it is, I think, something that California should look towards as well. And that will end my presentation. Thank you very much.